I honestly don't know where to begin when talking about this movie. The movie I'm going to talk about today is one of the greatest horror films, one of the greatest zombie films ever made, and is one of my top ten favorite fucking films of all time. George A. Romero's Dawn of the Dead. The 1978 version. Dawn of the Dead is just fucking amazing. Last year I covered Night of the Living Dead and I feel it was appropriate to continue in the series. Last year I think I talked about how the first time I saw Night of the Living Dead was on YouTube because it's a, I think it still is a public domain film. And I saw Dawn of the Dead for the first time six years ago. Yeah. Saw it back in 2010. And that was a... That was... Quite a October for me, 2010. I bought a lot of movies to really get into the spooky season along with Day of the Dead, I think, and I watched all three of Romero's classics in one night, I believe. My memory might be a little fuzzy on this, to be honest. I kind of got drunk the night I um, watched all three films. And maybe that was another night? I honestly can't remember. All I remember is 2010, October, I got really drunk while watching horror movies into the middle of the night. Other films that night, I believe, were Chud from 1984 and The Burning from 1981. That was also a month where I went to the Colonial Theater in Keene and I was with two former friends at the time and their girlfriends and we all watched the return of the living dead on the big screen. The Colonial does that sometimes. I haven't been there for October in a while, so... It'd be nice if they still do that. But yeah, <laughs> 2010, October, watching Dawn of the Dead, many other movies. Quite a memory for me. And just before anyone judges me, I didn't get drunk until after I watched the Romero films. You don't get drunk while watching these movies, even though that they are awesome. You save that for the... dopier horror films. I'm sorry if I'm rambling, and sorry if I'm... I might be getting some facts wrong, but I really did get drunk in October 2010 while staying up all night watching horror films. So, it's a little hard to remember, and for this review, I just, and for the season, I have come prepared with coffee, screwdriver, and while I still have it, the ectocore. Oh, and just for, maybe not during the review, but for after, some water, just to make my head feel better in case things get a little fuzzy. Okay, enough trips down fuzzy memory lane. Let's get into this fucker. Dawn of the Dead, it was the sequel to Night of the Living Dead. Came out ten years after Night, and this is one of those sequels where there are absolutely no characters from the original film, and it'd be a little hard to do that considering It'd be a little hard to bring any characters back from Night of the Living Dead, considering all the main characters in that film died at the end.
But with the way this series is set up, you don't need continuing characters. All you need is the storyline. And the titles in the original Dead trilogy really pretty much explain the story. They sort of show, like, the series of events that unfold. Night of the Living Dead obviously takes place at night, but it also shows the beginning of the zombie epidemic, showing how it's all starting and what people's reactions are just as this unbelievable thing is starting to happen and people are not sure if, they, if it will get worse or if they can stop it, but it's new and everybody in that film wasn't exactly worried about the end of the world. Dawn of the Dead? It's unclear just how long after Night of the Living Dead it takes place. There's a line in the film where some, at the beginning where someone says, You have not listened to this situation for the past three weeks! However, that could just refer to the um, mass hysteria that's going on at the beginning of the film. For all I know, and for all anyone else who watches Dawn of the Dead knows, the events could be taking place either weeks or months after night. And Night of the Living Dead, while it was made in 1968, there was no clear year that the film took place in, and it was all black and white, they didn't show too many appliances to indicate what year it took place in, so... Dawn could very well take place in the same year as night. But the film is about the zombie epidemic has gotten even worse and people are going either crazy or they're just panicking to the point that they won't listen to reason. The military is trying to stop the zombies. The media is trying to cover it and go at it from an angle to what they think will get them good ratings. And citizens are trying to take matters into their own hands and or they're joining the military. And George A. Romero, as many people have pointed out, he often writes commentaries, like social commentaries, into his movies. There are some movies that even Romero has said don't really carry a social commentary, but it's unlike him to not include something in there. Something that could be metaphorical or otherwise. And that's the general theme of Dawn of the Dead. That society is breaking down due to the zombie epidemic. There's panic going on and... The film centers around four main characters. These main characters are Stephen, played by David Emg. Uh, his last name is spelled E M G E. And Stephen's girlfriend, Francine, played by Galen Ross. And the other two main characters are two SWAT team members named Peter played by the awesomely badass Ken Forey, and Roger, played by Scott H. Reiniger. His last name is R-E-I-N-I-G-E-R. -E -E and the gist of these characters are Stephen and Francine work at a TV station, and they've decided that things have become so out of hand that it's best for them just to get up and leave. Stop trying to work with the system and stop trying to help the others and while that could be seen as selfish there it's like in some war movies where people who are prisoners of war are just trying to stay alive and they kinda of have to look out for themselves but they don't go without Steven asking his friend Roger to join them and Roger after being involved in a very nasty SWAT takedown of a building overrun with zombies, agrees to go, but also invites his SWAT buddy, Peter. And after that, we get about 15 minutes of them flying through the air, running on low fuel, finding a station, refueling, and then coming across what will serve as the main 
location of the film, a shopping mall. And that is probably what Dawn of the Dead is best known as, especially for people who haven't seen the film, but have heard of it. It's the zombie shopping film. And I know there's the Zack Snyder remake, which, I'll be honest, I have not seen yet. I am going to get to it at some point. But the Romero version, this is the version that I hear almost everybody talk about, or I read people commenting on the most. And Zack Snyder, people are so obsessed with Man of Steel and Batman vs. Superman that I don't see, and 300, that I don't see many comments on his Dawn of the Dead. And from that point on, Stephen, Francine, Peter, and Roger take up shelter in the shopping mall, and from there, Dawn of the Dead becomes a pretty fun ride. All of George A. Romero's dead movies that I've seen, especially the original trilogy, they are technically survival films, showing everybody doing what they can to survive, and they are some of the funnest survival films you can see. While Night of the Living Dead had a very secluded survival feel to it, with everybody being in a house, Dawn of the Dead takes it to the shopping mall, which is much bigger and has more luxuries to it. And it's kind of, it, it is a scary film, but it also is kind of a fun fantasy. If you were, if there was a zombie epidemic going on, what better place to shack up than a shopping mall? And there's a lot of fun moments of the characters going through these stores and just getting what they need and building their own little apartment in what was originally a storage closet. And then we get some fun bits of them going to the stores just for fun, where they get clothes, food. It just, it, it looks very fun. It looks very... It's like what everybody wishes they could do for just one day. But the film doesn't forget that it is a horror film, and something that George A. Romero d wanted to do with this version, next to having the commentary and the grisly gore, was also having a bit of a lighter mood compared to Night. And he wanted, he did this by... He said he was going to try and make the film as if it was a comic book, where there is some gritty realism to it, but also a little absurdity to the point where you can laugh a little in between the tense moments. And that's something that Dawn of the Dead excels at very well. It balances the dark moments and the lighter moments, and you never feel like you're having a sudden mood swing in the film. I mean, there are some very depressing scenes, and then we get followed by a gag, but the way it's done, it really fits. Unlike Knight, where he had a co-writer, he wrote and directed Dawn solely by himself. And the characters... Like most horror films, they don't exactly talk entirely like people do in real life, but it feels real enough that you really feel engaged with these characters. You really feel like you could relate to all of them. And the film is helped by an excellent music scoring. Some of the music is in the um, public domain, I think, or... It's stock music, but only for, like, the mall scenes where they're going shopping, and we get the generic elevator music that malls back then played. All silly and loopy and almost silent film era-esque. But the original soundtrack for this film is just... It's intense. It's breathtaking. It makes you get the it makes you feel pumped up. It makes you feel sad and where you're supposed to feel sad. And the music here is done by 
the very excellent band Goblin. Now, I'll be honest, outside of hearing their music in, the, in this film and the films of Dario Argento, I don't know a ton about them, but their music is just great, terrific, fucking awesome. And according to the film's credit, which calls them The Goblins, it also says that some of the music was contributed by Dario Argento himself. Dario Argento, he's very talented. I've seen a few of his films. Suspiria. And he used Goblin for that movie as well, and the music score in that film is just... It's just, uh, it's like a great, uh, lightning bolt that strikes your spine and sends you just like this as you try to handle the awesomeness and the shock of it all. And Dawn of the Dead, the film being made is partially owed to Dario. He was a great admirer of George A. Romero, and Romero was a great admirer of him as well. The two are very good friends these days, and they've worked together on a couple projects. Dario, when he heard that George was contemplating making a sequel to Night of the Living Dead, he insisted that Romero come out to Rome, where he lives, saying that he could write his script there without having any distractions. And from what I've read from IMDb, George A. Romero got the, what I would assume is the first draft of the script, out in three weeks. And Dario served some other jobs for Don that I can't fully remember, but those are the main things. And this may sound weird, but last night before I, when I went to bed before do, filming this particular review, I went to bed listening to the Dawn of the Dead theme. To hardcore Dawn fans, I bet that's what they do every night. To non-horror fans, let them think whatever they want. The opening scene from Dawn of the Dead features quite a few mixes of different music scores by Goblin. And the opening scene, which is just full of a lot of pandemonium, I guess is the word, has the music... Uh, scored to the actions on the screen just perfectly. And funny enough, Dario was not the only Argento working on this movie. His younger brother, Claudio Argento, along with a guy named Alfredo Cuomo, C-U-O-M-O, -O, the two of them are credited as being, associ being associated as producers on the film. The true producing credit goes to Richard P. Rubinstein, who produced several of Romero's films, especially in the 70s. But Richard P. Rubinstein, he's a good director. He stuck with Romero at, during the 70s when most of his films were failing and not making much profit. And through sticking with them, it's what led to him being the producer on Dawn of the Dead and helping get the funds for that, I think. From what I've read, that is generally what happened. I am trying my best to stick to the facts that I have read, and I did the best research I could over the past few days. I just want to try something. I want to see what the Ecto Cooler... I mean, I probably won't see it in the orange, but I just want to know what it will taste like with the alcohol. I don't know if you can see it, but there's... It was a little colorization, mainly on the top.
not much of a taste, but I did taste something new when I mixed those. And the only other producer on this film that I will give credit to is Donna Siegel, who is the associate producer. Don't know much about her, but if someone takes part in one of the greatest fucking films ever made, I will give her credit where credit is due. And the last thing that I'll say about the crew part of the film is that I watched a documentary that's on the box that I have here. And in one bit, apparently this, they had footage that was filmed during the making of the movie. George A. Romero was showing this interviewer pages from the script. And he talked about how generally in Hollywood, and this is something that has always, me personally, has always kind of annoyed me. It's generally assumed in Hollywood that a screenplay should be a minute per page. And George A. Romero talks about how he puts a lot of descriptions into his writing. And it's so descriptive, as he put it, that four pages could, will often actually end up being a minute of screen time. And while I haven't really done too much filmmaking in my life, despite my love of movies, I mean, I did do a short film, but before that, I had spent the past 10 or 12 fucking years of my life trying to write full-length screenplays. Ever since I was a dumb little retard. <laughs> and... The thing with me is, when I write, I... I just write so many descriptive things about the scenes. I've never made a movie from one of my big scripts, and be honest, I've never really finished any of my big scripts because I have a weird attention span thing where I get devoted to writing a script, but then a new idea pops up and I've worked so long on the original one that part of me has lost interest. It's fucking bullshit, and... It sucks, but hopefully I'm getting better. But anyway, before I... <laughs> I've gone off track a bit now. But, um... I'm very descriptive in my writing to the point where many people have talked about how when they read my screenplay attempts, they can really... They say to me that they can visualize the scene in their head as if they're almost watching it. And I'm not trying to make myself look good. I want to make that clear. That's not what I'm doing. I'm just showing how I relate to George A. Romero when he talked about how descriptive he is in his writing. Except he can, um, actually finish. But, yeah, that, that was a cool fact to learn, and that's just something cool to relate to one of your idols on. And I, my, my best friend, Mike, who is a huge lover of Goblin, has said that something he thinks is Romero's weakest point would be some of his writing, and maybe for some of his latest films, but... I generally think George A. Romero is a decent writer. So yeah, that's the majority of the crew credits. But there is one more person on this movie's crew who deserves his own entire section too. Well, George A. Romero, Richard P. Rubinstein, Dario Argento, and the Goblins are the primary crew members. There is one other primary crew member who Without Dawn of the Dead, would not have been as memorable as it is. 
That man is Tom motherfucking Savini. A ma he's a master of special makeup effects. He has an amazing talent. He's kind of a dick when during fan interviews, but I let that slide. But he's the guy who did probably 99.7% of all the makeup effects in Dawn. He also did the makeup for Romero's Day of the Dead, Creepshow, and Two Evil Eyes, and many more. Tom Savini is also the makeup artist, and I probably mentioned this in another earlier video, but not everybody has seen my earlier videos. So Tom Savini is also the makeup guy for the first Friday the 13th film. And he's also, he was also for The Burning, which is the superior sl summer camp slasher film. He worked on Friday the 13th, the final chapter, the fourth one. And he's collaborated with Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez. Not so much in makeup, but as far as being an actor in some of their movies. He was Sex Machine in From Dust Till Dawn. He was Osiris Amampur in Machete. And I didn't spot him, but I know he played... He's credited as playing a tracker in Django Unchained. And, uh, he, I think he also helped out with some of the effects on Django Unchained. Oh, and he was a, he was a borderline retarded deputy in Planet Terror. Robert Rodriguez's, is <laughs> Robert Rodriguez's film for the Grindhouse double feature he did with Quentin Tarantino. And that film itself was a zombie movie. But here in Dawn of the Dead, Tom Savini, next to doing all the makeup work, was also a stuntman for the film. Dawn of the Dead's budget was $650,000. For what it cost to make it, they made it look so much bigger than it was. But they couldn't afford a team of stunt people. So Tom Savini and his buddy, Tasso and Stavrakis, filled in for almost every stunt you see in Dawn of the Dead, which led to the two of them getting some serious injuries. While filming at the Monroeville Mall in Monroeville, Pennsylvania, Savini had to do a stunt where... He not only was a stuntman for this, he was also an actor. <laughs> Big job. He plays a biker towards the end of Dawn of the Dead, which I'll get into later, who gets killed in the mall and goes over the railing on the second floor. And for the shot of him going over the railing, the film could not afford, from what I gathered, a crash mat for him to land on. They had to just take like 20 to 50 cardboard boxes, stack them five at a time, and then they put some mattresses on top of them for Savini to land on. Oh boy. And behind the scenes, we see that on either the first or second take, when he jumped over and landed on that, he missed his mark. It wasn't as bad as you'd think. He, he didn't hit the floor, but he was supposed to land on top of the mattress. There were several mattresses on these boxes. Instead of landing in the middle, he went between the mattresses. I think he was okay afterwards, but god motherfucking damn. Shit. That had to have been scary. I've, uh, I once, I once went on a rope swing over, like, a swimming hole by a waterfall, and it was like a 30-foot drop from that rope. And, so put it simply, I never did it again. And, and when I hit the water from that height, it literally felt like a brick had just slammed me in the chest. And for anyone who's interested in the how-tos of the makeup effects, Tom Savini, and this is 
makes it even more impressive. Tom Savini does, at least on this movie, he did almost all of his makeup effects on the spot. Yeah. He apparently does not... He's retired from doing makeup, but when he did do makeup, he did these effects with almost no preparation. For some, that would be pretty fucking stupid, but for him, it seemed to really work. And some of these effects are a scene where a biker sticks his arm into one of those blood level um, cuff things. At, it's like one of those booths at a mall that will do that for you. And while sticking his arm in there, the zombies attack this guy. And they rip his whole body off of the arm. Leaving it in there. Which leads to a funny moment where the machine beeps and it says, Blood pressure, 000 over 000. And... There's also the scene where a guy played by Tasso and Stavrakis himself gets his intestines ripped out of his stomach, and uh, I think they made. I think he, he had to have been a really skinny man for this, but they made like fake abs for him, and the intestines they get ripped out were actual cow intestines. Tom Savini apparently lived next to a slaughterhouse, from what I've read, and I gave him the idea to use that. There's also this great scene where a zombie is... I think this is Tom Savini, the effect he's most proud of. There's a scene where a zombie is moving up on top of a crate, and it's heading towards Roger, who is refueling the helicopter that they, all the main characters fly in. And he sees the zombie slowly coming towards him, and he's suddenly scared, wondering what he's going to do. And then the zombie gets on top of the crate, and as it stands there, the helicopter blades that are spinning just take off the top half of the, the zombie's head killing it instantly, given the dead series theme that once you remove the head or the brain, the zombie can officially die. For this effect, they had to get a guy with a very low forehead, like the top of his head around here, and then they added another top half, making him look kind of like a Frankenstein-ish motherfucker. And just some fun trivia facts. Tom Savini, apparently for the majority of the film, used the same dummy for certain death scenes. And during the time that they filmed, the dummy was blown up, burnt, shot, and beaten. Doesn't have anything on Bill Murray from Groundhog Day. And there's also some zombies that are missing limbs in the film. And the majority of these zombies, and there's also some living characters that are missing some limbs. But these characters are actual amputees. Guess that saves money on some of the makeup and effects. But that's a pretty cool fact. And extras who worked on Dawn of the Dead reportedly... Once again, this is stuff I'm going on from IMDb, so... Could be real, could be a load of ass shit, but... Extras for Dawn of the Dead were reportedly given $20 in cash, a box lunch, and a Dawn of the Dead t-shirt. You might as well bitch slap me for not wearing a Dawn of the Dead t-shirt, but... I don't know where to get one at the moment. I'm not made of money, and I think my Malcolm Ray is the Devil t-shirt is good enough for this review. And the last big thing to mention about Savini's makeup is 
When it came to choosing the deathly color to give the zombies in this film, Tom Savini chose the color gray because of Night of the Living Dead being in black and white and there being no true color, but he thought that gray would keep to the maybe black and white-ish tone that the original had. He apparently wound up regretting this because he thought they came out looking rather blue in on film. And when watching the movie, I can see that. At times they do look very gray, at times they do look a little bluey, but I think it all depends on the lighting that was used for the scene. You can't compliment the man enough, but there's another side to his makeup history that is definitely worth mentioning, and I may have mentioned it last year, but if I did, fuck it, it needs to be mentioned again. Tom Savini was almost the makeup artist on Night of the Living Dead, but either through dra the draft or he enlisted, he went to Vietnam and stayed there for a few years. From what I read, he was a combat photographer. And yeah, Tom Savini's a Vietnam veteran, and he has said that when doing these graphic gory effects, when making them, if it doesn't unsettle him the same way it did when he was in Vietnam and saw the gore of war, then he feels he still needs to work on it. That's just very interesting, in my opinion. When you have seen real gore, what is the movie violence like to you, and 